question, of course. Um, so, welcome back. And today I will uh, tackle the issue of including collisional aspects in the propagation of cosmic rays. So, uh, to remind you where we uh, started from, essentially we were working under the approximation of the collisionless part of the Boltzmann equation, and then we basically spend a lot of time in rewriting this transport piece, uh, first assuming, you know, modeling what happens for fluctuations on magnetic inhomogeneities, and also, um, and also uh, extending it to uh, moving magnetic inhomogeneities yesterday, and we saw how we can use this fact uh, to uh, accelerate cosmic rays, okay? However, the fact this right-hand side being zero is just an approximation. Uh, a better approximation to the reality is to include here what is called uh, the collisional piece, and this is known as Boltzmann equation now. Huh? Uh, this is still an approximation, as I quickly argued in the lecture number two. Uh, but still, it's a much better uh, description of reality. And so, the, the task today is to give you some idea of what this term is in practical processes of interest for cosmic rays, and in particular, to write this term in, in a sort of, uh, let's say, C tilde term for our friend phi, which is the ensemble average, uh, angular average uh, cosmic ray. Um, observable, okay? So if you wish, I should write it like that, or if you remember what we said yesterday, this should be written like that in the sense that this is measured as momentum measured in the frame of the scattering center. Okay, so uh, a few notions which hopefully are just reminders of what you already know. Uh, if you have a collisions, uh, collisions involving uh, several particles, for instance, just two uh, a plus B going into something else, uh, the one important Mandelstam variable S, uh, PA plus PB squared in these two body uh, process, of course you have the sum of all momenta if there are multiple particles, this guy is conserved, okay? Um, now this is important, okay, explicitly in the case there you would write it as MA squared plus MB squared, plus, you know, two PA dot PB, so you have EA, EB, and then you have one minus, basically, beta A, beta B, cosinus of the angle. Huh? This is conserved, and the, 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 the conservation of S can be used, and is used in general, to, uh, to um, estimate threshold for processes that can uh, produce new particles. For instance, for inelastic processes, this is an important uh, simple tool that you can use. Um, and we will see an example soon, uh, how to estimate uh, threshold for uh, processes important for uh, cosmic ray, for cosmic ray uh, propagation. Uh, for instance, one process that is of practical interest may be the production of antiprotons in the collision of cosmic ray protons uh, uh, in the interstellar medium. So you apply this to PP going into what? If I put here one antiproton, uh, conservation of baryon number, conservation of electric charge forces me to say that this is the minimum number of particles that I must have in the final state, right? To, to satisfy uh, all the process. So I invite to, to check that basically, if you Im impose the conservation of S, this requires that the energy of your proton impinging, let's say this is the proton in cosmic rays, this is the proton in the interstellar medium as a target, this requires that the energy of your uh, proton at threshold, so where there is no kinetic energy basically in the final state, is roughly larger than seven uh, GeV huh? in order to produce this. Um, Another thing that I wanted to, to tell you, which maybe is not obvious to some of you, um, let me consider another 
another um, Mandelstam variable, T, huh? let me give you a concrete example, say a, an electron elastic scattering. Huh? Just to be concrete, this is an electron. Huh? This is uh, P, A, P, B, this is another electron or positive. Uh, P, B prime, P, A prime. Huh? You can write the, the, the T variable, this is P A minus P A prime, of course this is also square, also equal to P B minus P B prime. This is the momentum exchanged, the delta P associated to this process. Huh? And um, in the case at hand, this would write 2 M E square uh, minus 2 E E E prime E 1 minus beta A uh, beta A prime cosinus of theta, which is the angle of, uh, of scattering of your uh, electron. In the ultra-relativistic regime, you can neglect this with respect to the energy, beta tends to 1. And so this expression just rewrites minus 4 e e, e e prime sinus square theta alpha. Huh? Now, uh, you can notice a few things. Of course, this is negative. Huh? So, uh, not surprisingly, it's a Q square which is negative, which means equivalently that this photon is not on shell, huh? <laughs> because otherwise Q square should be zero. So this is, uh, but, but that's not what I wanted to, 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 to point out. Uh, what I wanted to point out is this guy is uh, um, entering this momentum exchange, uh, enters cross-section of soft processes. For instance, I'm sure you have seen Rutherford scattering. Huh? Rutherford scattering because it's an important experiment in the history of particle physics. And uh, you remember the dependence of the uh, uh, um, cross-section for Rutherford scattering, which was going uh, basically proportional to Z1, Z2, huh? the, the, the charge is alpha, the charges of your um, uh, nuclei, huh? the, that would be whatever, alpha particle and target nucleus, and then in that scattering you had a dependence which was exactly like sinus fourth of theta half. Huh? This was the scaling for the, for the Rutherford scattering. Huh? And what does it mean? It means that in, you have a large cross-section when theta is small. Huh? And a very small cross-section for large scattering angles. Now, this is equivalent, basically, to say that the scaling here is as 1 over uh, t square. Hmm? It's, these are obvious things, right? <laughs> the, 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 but, but, but what it tells you is that for, for largest part of the cross-section is dominated by a small angle scattering, which means that when you uh, look at the bulk of the interactions of interest for cosmic rays. These are the soft interactions that we really care about for cosmic ray physics. And this is very different from the situation that you have at LHC. Okay? At LHC, one naive condition that you might have on T for, for, uh, for producing a new particle of mass capital M would be that uh, you know, uh, T must be larger than M squared. If you do not exchange enough momentum, you cannot produce your particle in the process. Okay? So at LHC, you want these things, this denominator to be large. So you look at small cross-section, uh, rare events, IPT. Mm, that's equivalent ways to put the, the same thing. In cosmic rays, you look to what is called forward type of physics. Forward is, in this case, is the manifestation of the fact that you look at small angles. Huh? And this soft physics is very hard to uh, model for adronic processes, of course, because then you are usually in a non-perturbative regime of QCD. So um, you don't have a perturbative uh, technique for uh, fundamental theories uh, to handle it. Um, so there are different models, more or less advanced models, um, matching sometimes, in the best cases, matching some lattice results. In some other cases, they are purely phenomenological and they are fitted to experimental data. 
the difficulty is that if you look at the highest energies that we, we deal with in a cosmic rays, 10 to 20 electron volt, the processes are actually at a central mass energy which is above the LHC one. So if you don't have a theory and you don't have um, data to calibrate to, you know, there are uncertainties associated to this. Uh, uh, so particle physics uncertainties, which are, however, of different nature of what you might be used to uh, with respect to BSM type of physics. It is a regime where you do not control your standard model theory. Okay, so this is something that, um, and although you don't hear much about this type of physics, there are many people at LHC that are doing this soft physics, not as many as uh, people working at IPT type of physics at ATLAS or CMS, uh, but there are also experiments devoted to that. You might have heard about LHCF, uh, TOTEM, uh, uh, ALICE to some extent, etc., etc. Okay, And even within ATLAS and CMS, some people take uh, uh, care about these things. Um, another thing I wanted to, to, to introduce, probably again reminders, are notions of mean free uh, uh, mean free path and uh, interaction rate. Now, there are two extreme cases in collisional effects in cosmic rays. There is the case where um, a, a, a lot of your energy is lost. Sometimes even the nature of particle is changed. Huh? Think of a case that we will shortly analyze in more detail. Think of this case, gamma, gamma. This is an energetic gamma. This is a background gamma, pair producing. In this case, basically now you have completely lost your photon. Huh? So this is a sort of catastrophic event where the process depletes your photon beam. Huh? Um, the, the meaningful quantities in this type of processes to consider are the mean free path. Of course, you can always consider uh, these quantities, but here they have a stronger meaning, so to speak. The mean free path L which is one over the density of your target sine the, the cross section. Uh, and then you have an interaction rate, which is nothing but uh, N uh, sigma uh, beta. Okay, so uh, this is uh, equivalent to uh, beta over uh, L. Okay, uh, and this is what actually will enter in the right hand side of the Boltzmann uh, of our transport equation. Okay, so basically what I'm saying is that in this case where you get rid of your flux, it's enough that at the right hand side, you just introduce minus gamma phi. Okay, in principle, this is the rate of all possible processes that can deplete your cosmic ray beam. Of course, think of this, if you have this process for photons, so for particles, you also have injection, okay, let me write it more explicitly, you also have all processes summing over beta of gamma of beta into alpha times phi of beta. This process is a, a sink for photons. It's a source for electrons and positrons. Uh, so you have this obvious uh, uh, matching. In this case, for photons, this process enters here. For electrons, this process enters here. Okay. Um, there are, however, processes which are not of this form. Think of uh, uh, an example of an electron or charged particle crossing a material. It can ionize uh, uh, the material. And in each ionization event, your proton or electron loses only a tiny bit of its energy and the nature is conserved. So the way people, I mean, this is, this is still defined for this case, huh? the rate of interaction or the mean free path, of course, but that's not what we are really interested in. We are rather interested to how much energy it loses per unit time or per unit length. And this is modeled as a continuous energy loss process. In, in, in particular in cosmic rays, but not only in cosmic ray uh, physics. So the concept that we introduced then is rather the DE over DT, or if you wish, the which is negative, that's why I put a, a, a minus sign so that this quantity is positive, or the DE over DX uh, per unit length or per unit uh, uh, um, of time. Of course, the link between the two is through a factor of velocity. Uh, um, and then you can introduce also 
some um, simple quantities, for instance, you can introduce a, ta a, a, a ta characteristic time scale uh, of a loss mechanism, an energy loss mechanism, that you can define as nothing but uh, E over minus DE over DT, for instance. Equally, you could define the same quantity for space is what you call sometimes range. Uh, and typically, it's also integrated over uh, the path. But you have seen these things. Huh? And if you compare this time scale with 1 over the, 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 the rate, now you have something quantitative that can tell you, is this uh, continuous energy loss process more important than, for instance, a catastrophic energy loss uh, type of process? And uh, this is sometimes important if you want to have a quick quick and dirty estimate of what are the processes that are more important to consider in a given uh, setup for cosmic ray propagation. So before solving an equation in full glory, you want to get rid of all terms which are maybe orders of magnitude smaller than what and the other one. Um, and um, um, how do you introduce these terms in the, in, the, in the equation? Let me first tell you that, and then we will come back to solving maybe uh, this equation for a for some specific case. Well, this is very similar to the term that we had seen yesterday in changing momentum. Let me write it here so that maybe we can keep it. So basically, you just add at the right hand side now uh, something that looks like uh, uh, one over p square derivative with respect to p of p square if we work in momentum space. Huh? If we work in energy space, of course, it's directly this quantity, but they are related times phi. Huh? So this is just a, a differential operator for spherical, uh, because we are in spherical symmetry. Huh? And this is the energy, lo the momentum change per unit time. Okay, so you add this type of piece at the right hand side of your equation, and now this is a continuous energy loss. This is equivalent to the d over d, d, dt. There is just a velocity factor between the two. And I just write p because we, are we have written our equation in momentum space, not because I'm uh, schizophrenic in this context. Okay? So the point is, uh, let's write down some of these terms just to have an idea of how this, this function look like, what are the processes that influence these functions, and then I will show you um, for instance, what happens when in our transport equation, these energy loss terms are the dominating one in the transport, rather than whatever, advection or uh, adiabatic uh, pieces, etc., etc. So let's do a bit of uh, zoology, so to speak. Uh, what can happen to our, to our uh, cosmic rays? So uh, to make another thing that you might hear, uh, you might hear about is the is the um, optical depth. It's a concept, it, it's a trivial concept. If, if you have a region of, of size, spatial size r, uh, and uh, you have a mean free path for whatever process, which is L, uh, you just define the optical depth in this region for this process uh, as basically r over uh, L. If this ratio is smaller than one, you, t you say that this, uh, this situation is transparent with respect to that process. Otherwise, it's opaque. Uh, it means that basically a beam of the particles undergoing this process, propagating through this region, will be significantly affected if the optical depth is larger than one, and not more literally affected if it's uh, smaller than one. An example, uh, the process I wrote there, gamma, gamma, e plus, e minus, okay? That process has a, uh, let's first compute, for instance, the threshold, okay? We write, we want uh, two electrons, basically, uh, in the final state. We write S for the initial state. Mass of the photon is zero. We just apply that formula there. The threshold for that process happens when, you know, 2 e gamma epsilon uh, times 1 minus cosinus theta is equal to what? Is equal to 2 me 
square, this is going to determine my threshold when, when this piece is the largest. This is the minimum energy I need in order for this process to take place. Huh? So you get a factor four here. This is largest and it attains two. Four here, so you get E gamma must be larger than M E square over epsilon. This is the energy of my background photon. Okay, so if you compute, for instance, uh, if you take infrared to ultraviolet light, let's say fraction of electron volt to electron volts, uh, this, this energy turns out to be in the TeV range. Mm -hmm. So remember the extragalactic background light I introduced at the beginning. Basically, uh, photons will uh, pair produce on the extragalactic background light. And what's the mean free path of photons? onto this extragalactic background light. It depends on the, on the number density of photons in the extragalactic background light. I can tell you that this is typically in the 10 megaparsec range. Huh? So what does it mean? That at, at, at energies which are TV-ish, maybe 10 TV or so, the, 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 you start losing visibility of the extragalactic sky. Not completely. These are not uh, extremely huge suppression, but still, these are visible, these have been measured. Huh? So at TV, the very far sources disappear, should disappear, should disappear, if the standard model is all there is, of course. Hmm? Uh, if you compute the same for energies of the CMB, milli electron volt, you will end up with PV energies. And the, however, the CMB number density of photons is much larger. It's roughly 400 photons per centimeter cube. So the mean free path is much shorter. I invite you to, to do the estimate, it's 10 kiloparsec. So basically, at PV energy, so millions of, uh, of GV, you don't see beyond your galaxy. So photons from external galaxy will n should never get to you, should, because we have just started exploring this domain of uh, uh, photon astronomy, uh, should never get to you from, say, Andromeda. So we are blind to the extragalactic sky at PV energies with photons. Okay? These are simple calculations that you can do in one line and should tell you a lot about what you should look for, where, etc. Of course, this is true if there is no new physics. Imagine that th on, on these astrophysical scales, Many things can happen. For instance, Lorentz, vi Lorentz invariance violation. This would change this conclusion. Or you have some mixing between photons and a new particle like an axion or an axion-like particle. Then axions are not subject to this process. So the effective, and maybe this axion can back convert into photons. So the mean free path that we have estimated is, is much shorter than the real mean free path that nature has chosen. So you can imagine that one search for new physics is just looking at extragalactic sources at very high energies. You should see nothing. If you see something in photons, wow, Nobel Prize type of discovery. Okay? So this starts telling you how simple arguments can give you access to new physics searches. Um, by the way, this is also one of the reasons why you want to do neutrino astrophysics at high energies. Because neutrinos are not subject to this limitation. So you can certainly do high energy PV neutrino astrophysics in principle, if there is any neutrino flux. And not surprisingly, from my point of view, the first type of astrophysical, most likely extragalactic flux of neutrinos that IceCube has discovered is in this energy range. And now a lot of efforts among astrophysicists is to make sense of this. Where do they come from? And the tr why it's so hard? One reason why it's so hard is because we have no idea how the, the, the sky in photons looks like at these energies. Okay? So it might be that Ice Cube has detected a neutrino counterpart of known objects, but it might also be that these objects that shine in PV neutrinos are basically only visible in PV neutrinos. So it's a new class of astrophysical objects. We don't know yet. Um, let me mention 
a few of the processes and, 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 and quantities that we will need. I won't, I, I'm afraid I, I won't be able to go enter into details. In the notes, you will find more details if you are unfamiliar with them. But just a few things that you might want to be uh, aware of if you um, want to quickly estimate some quantities. For instance, when you look at spectra uh, of a supernova remnants, they might look uh, very... Uh, you know, boring to you, but they contain some physics, and I just want to give you some information so that you can quickly estimate some things. So, um, most of the photons that you that we see in the um, non-thermal uh, realm, we believe are associated to leptonic energy loss channels. Huh? In particular, interactions of electrons with um, magnetic fields, huh? synchrotron type of radiation, or photon fields, and these are inverse Compton type of uh, processes. Okay? Uh, one of the challenges in uh, high energy astrophysics is to identify sources where photons, gamma rays in general, come from adronic processes, not leptonic ones. Okay? We are still not completely sure of where this adronic component of gamma rays dominates. The reason is that leptons are much lighter and they radiate much more easily. So, um, just, to, just to give you uh, 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 an idea of why it is so, uh, maybe think of the, just think of the Thompson cross-section, right? So, the Thompson cross-section uh, scales as, you know, alpha over m e square for electrons. If I do calculate the same cross-section, for for uh, sorry yeah no it's uh, it should be alpha square I think alpha square over m the correct formula should be eight pi over three I think huh? this is now inequality if I'm not wrong in natural units uh, if you compute the same for a, a, a proton or a nucleus huh, this would give you um, basically you can rewrite this in terms of z fourth over a square, and then you have uh, uh, m e over m proton square uh, times sigma Thompson for the electron. This ratio is less than 10 to the minus 6. So the, the electromagnetic uh, uh, probability of interaction of, of a proton or of nuclei is much, much smaller than the one that you have uh, for electrons just because of the mass ratio. So electrons tend to interact much more easily. And that's why we think that most of what we see is actually leptonic in nature. Okay? Um, now, <clears throat> what are the key quantities you want to... You want to um, know about when, when dealing with, say, electron uh, synchrotron radiation and uh, electron uh, inter intervening in inverse Compton. So from the diagrammatic point of view, if you write diagrams for the inverse Compton, say, this is nothing but, you know, the process is just E plus gamma into E plus gamma. Huh? So depending on what is the target, what is the, 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 the projectile, you call it Compton scattering or inverse Compton scattering. But, uh, and, and then you have some photon, and then you radiate it. Huh? But you have also another process where you have some electron in a magnetic field, which actually can radiate some photon. Diagrammatically, you would write it like, you know, this is a sort of external uh, source, uh, this is a virtual photon, and you radiate this, uh, this synchrotron photon. So, I mean, e even if classically they might look very different to you, they, are they should be described by the same type of diagrams. And in fact, you see explicitly that if you compute things like the link between the energy of this photon and the energy of this electron. Uh, I just give you the formula. If you want some justification for where this formula comes from, uh, you can look into the notes. Uh, so the typical frequency 
of a synchrotron photon, this is the one that is emitted when electrons uh, uh, radiate in a magnetic field, is related to the, to the gamma factor of this electron huh, through gamma square times the, the gyro frequency that you have in this, the, the non-relativistic gyro frequency that you have in this magnetic field. Okay, so just to give you concrete numbers, you get that the energy of the synchrotron photon is given by, is roughly 500 microelectron volt uh, times the magnetic field in micro gauss times the energy of the electron in GeV square. And the typical link that you have in inverse Compton uh, the energy of photons for inverse Compton is similarly given by gamma square times the energy of the target photon, epsilon, where gamma is the gamma factor of the electron. Okay, this formula breaks down, so this formula, both formula actually, but are only valid as long as the energy of the electron times the whatever energy of uh, virtual or real of the background photon is, is much smaller than the mass of the electron square, which is basically always the case for synchrotron, but not always the case for inverse Compton. Okay. Um, you can derive this from the kinematics of the Compton scattering. You probably have seen this in quant introduction to quantum mechanics. If not, it's in the notes. Huh? Um, so, for instance, you can easily use this, this relation to, s to conclude that I don't know, if you have a, a, an electron of GeV-ish energies, the gamma factor is 1,000. Huh? So 1,000 square is a million, 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7. So a photon of a one electron volt will end up being a 10, 10 MeV, something like that. So this is a process through which you can produce high energy photons. You might wonder, how do you accelerate photons? You cannot use <laughs> electric fields directly, right? Or even moving magnetic fields. So what we believe that all this non-thermal radiation that, that we see basically comes from energy loss processes of charged particles. And these are examples of how you get whatever, from radio to X-rays, uh, typically from, for synchrotrons, and from, uh, from uh, soft gammas to, or maybe even hard X-rays up to who knows what, very hard gamma rays, perhaps. Depends on how much you can accelerate the, the electron. Um, another thing that you can, um, uh, can compute is, is basically, um, is basically the, 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 um, the power that is radiated. Or if you wish, we want to compute the d over dt. Huh? How much energy? the electron loses through this process per unit time or per unit length. And uh, there are different ways to, to see this, but basically both formulas, both, both processes, sorry, uh, lead to the same expression. In the, at least, again, in, the, in that limit, sorry, in that limit where E times epsilon is much smaller than Me, which is also called Thomson limit. Huh? The opposite limit when this product is larger than the mass of the electron is called klein nishina limit, okay? Um, so the energy loss for these two processes is basically given, okay, approximately because of this, this fact, four-thirds gamma square U sigma T, hmm? U is the energy density in whatever background you are dealing with. Huh? So U is, in general, in a classical setting, would be the average value of E square over 8 pi plus B square over uh, 8 pi. So this is the magnetic energy density background, and this is the, the electric energy density background. In an actual context, this is the energy density of the photons of your background. Uh, so you, you can basically estimate through b square over 8 pi, whatever b uh, background is present, plus the energy of the background time, the number density of the photons of your background. Okay? Uh, yeah, basically one way to look at this is like, 
you, you can think of it in a particle physics uh, uh, sense by saying that this is the product of what? Of the cross section times a number density times the, the typical energy that you get for the background huh? times the, the, the energy that actually it's upscattered to. So if you rewrite this as sigma t times basically u, you write as epsilon times number density, and then you get this four thirds gamma square. But this times this is exactly the energy that you release in a collision. Huh? So you, although this, this formula can be computed in a classical electrodynamic settings, but a posteriori, you can interpret it in a particle uh, uh, meaning. And this is true in general. The d over dt, you can always sort of estimate uh, with this type of uh, thinking. You have a cross-section, you have a number density, and you have an energy per particle that is emitted, and this gives the right scaling. So the only hard part of the calculation is actually this sort of four-third and, and so on and so forth. Um, okay. Um, I don't want to... Uh, wait, one thing that is important is the fact that this scales quadratically with the energy of your electrons. Keep this in mind. So gamma is energy of the electron over the mass of the electron, huh? is the, the Lorentz factor of your electron. So this is one thing that I want you to keep in mind. Uh, it's not the only process to which... Actually, these, these two processes are the two main energy loss channels onto electromagnetic fields, onto radiation. Electrons can also lose uh, energy. When I say electron here, I mean both electrons and positrons. Eh? Uh, can also lose energy uh, by interaction with matter. Now, I'm pretty sure that you have studied this process uh, in a completely different context, probably in detector physics, in lab or whatever. This is the bed block type of equation. Uh, I don't think there is any experimental class that is complete if they don't introduce the bed block in a, a particle detector uh, type of things. So I won't repeat the derivation. If you want a reminder of where it comes from, you find it in the notes. One thing that you might remember, and I remind you if you don't, uh, is, the, is the fact that the energy loss per unit time or per unit length is only weakly dependent f um, upon uh, energy in the relativistic limit. So it's a logarithmic dependence. It's almost energy independent. So what I'm just saying is that the energy loss, dE over dT for, I, I, I would call it ionization. How does the electron or the charged particle lose energy through the bed block? It's basically kicking electrons uh, in, in the atoms, and, and in each uh, collision, it loses a little bit of energy. Okay, That's how it happens. And that's how you derive, actually. Uh, but this is almost constant with energy. Uh, there is a logarithmic dependence, and of course this is not true anymore in the non-relativistic limit, but deep in the non-relativistic limit, in a certain sense, we don't talk anymore about cosmic rays, so uh, I don't care. For me, it's a constant thing. And uh, another process that, again, is often subleading, but you might want to hear about, uh, is the fa is the Bremsstrahlung, okay? This is something that intervenes typically at energies a bit larger than than uh, than the ionization losses. So diagrammatically, this is just you know you have you have uh, some external source, some like a nucleus, uh, the the electric field of a nucleus, and then your your electron you know radiates. This is the Bremsstrahlung. Uh, so you can think of it like an external nucleus emitting this photon. Huh? Again, now you have an extra vertex with respect to the Compton uh, uh, process, right? So in the amplitude, you get an extra factor E. In the cross-section, you get an extra factor E square, because it's the modulus square. So this process is, in fact, suppressed by a factor alpha with respect to that is an alpha time smaller. Uh, however, the energy dependence is different, and, if, and actually you can get an enhancement, because if instead here of a proton you have a nucleus, uh, you get in general a z-square enhancement. Um, 
the only thing that I want to mention this for is that actually the d over dt for the Bremsstrahlung is proportional to energy. So the energy dependent being uh, different, even if there is this suppression, you expect that at higher energies, this will take over with respect to, to this one eventually. And of course, at even higher energies, you would expect that the, the inverse Compton and, uh, and uh, uh, synchrotron take over. So you have this hierarchy in mind at very low energies for us, let's say sub G V uh, uh, you expect that ionization losses actually dominate in up to 10 TV, uh, sorry, 10 uh, GV or a few GV Bremsstrahlung uh, is important if you plug in the numbers. Huh? And then eventually uh, it's uh, uh, inverse Compton and, and uh, uh, synchrotron that are important above. And we will see what this implies for our, for our spectra huh? in, a, in a short uh, moment. Are there questions up to now? I think this is just a bit of zoology. It's not, I, I, I don't enter into details of calculation, so hopefully it's not too hard. Um, I already argued that for protons, for nuclei, this type of electromagnetic interactions usually uh, are not very important, at least in the galactic context. I will come back to that in a second. Uh, for the simple reason that the cross sections are much smaller. Hmm? So for a, diff for a finite path length or time scale, usually they, you can forget about this, usually. Um, what is more important, however, for hadrons is that they can undergo strong interactions. And they can undergo strong interaction with the matter that they cross in the interstellar medium. Now, uh, strong interactions are, 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 are short range type of interactions, and, uh, but they are very strong. <laughs> huh? So in fact, if you wonder what are the typical cross sections that these nuclei have, or proton nuclei, et cetera, have, uh, if you just use the, the geometric cross section, huh? something like pi r square, nuclei are not point-like. Huh? They have a finite size. They are not fundamental particles, right? So you can use the, what you learn in nuclear physics. You know, R is roughly 1.2 a one third Fermi to estimate what the, this cross section is. And in fact, you want, I mean, if you plug in numbers, I think if I did it correctly, you get something like 45 millibarn times a to the two thirds. And this is not, not far from actually what you really find for the typical cross-section for, for uh, nuclei in the interstellar medium. And that's enough to be sizable in the sense that over the 10 million years time scale that we estimated and the one particle per centimeter cube density that you find, you have a sizable probability. You know, when I say sizable is 10 percentage or something like that, that you interact uh, while propagating, okay? So the corrections at the right-hand side of our Boltzmann equations are not that small, okay? Um, what happens physically? Well, uh, it depends on the momentum that you exchange. Now, for typical gev energies, the processes that change, the momentum that you exchange in these collisions, I don't know, can range from tens of MeV and or maybe 100 MeV or so. And these energy scales are larger than the binding energies of uh, nucleons in a nucleus. So the most typical outcome is that you break up the nucleus. Huh? So you may have proton plus helium that goes into, uh, I don't know, deuterium plus uh, proton plus neutron, or helium-3 plus neutron, things like that. So these processes are known as spallation. Okay. If you go to very, very, very high energies, eventually the energy typical processes may resolve the nuclear structure. You may have hadronic processes, pion production, things like that, uh, delta resonances that are excited. However, the residence time of your protons or cosmic ray in the galaxy decreases with energy. So the time available for doing uh, the collision sh uh, uh, shrinks which means that the probability that you undergo collision shrinks. So collisional processes qualitatively become less and less important, these ones, when you go to higher energies. 
So the, re the region in, in energy space where these things are most important, I would say, is for, for as, a, as a sink term, is below tens of, G, of GV at most. Huh? Um, of course, as a source term, they are always important. <laughs> for if a particle is a daughter nucleus, remember the lithium, beryllium, boron, these fragile nucleus, they are, they are not accelerated as far as we know in the sources. So this is exactly the type of processes that, that intervene. You know, something like a proton or cosmic rays eating a carbon nucleus, this produces uh, uh, a proton plus proton plus, uh, uh, plus a boron. Huh? This is the main source term for these species, so you have to take into account at any energy. Um, in these processes, what is interesting is that the energy per nucleon is roughly conserved. So you can think of it like the proton strikes this nucleon out and the remaining residual keeps living its life. Huh? So that's why sometimes you, you plot things in terms of energy per nucleon or kinetic energy per nucleon, because if you want to compare the effects of these processes, <coughs> you don't have to do <coughs> you know, complicated convolutions of spectra, blah, blah, blah. You can just estimate that whatever the energy per nucleon was in the carbon is also the energy per nucleon that is retained in, in, in the boron. Um, can you compute these things from first principles? Forget about it. Um, there are some semi-empirical models that try to, 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 um, to have an idea of how these cross-sections behave with energy. So typically, uh, let's see, as a function of energy, the cross-sections that you have, you have a regime below, I don't know, maybe, this is the, key, uh, the, the, the energy, or better, let's say, the kinetic energy of your cosmic ray. Uh, there is some, I, I'm making up the numbers, eh? don't, don't be too uh, confident on the numbers, but there is something in the tens, hundreds of uh, MeV scale where, uh, let's say, nuclear effects can, are really important. Usually it rises, this cross-section, but it depends, it can have funny shapes. Uh, it depends if there are resonances or things like that, uh, excited state of the nucleus. Uh? Then there is a regime where this is roughly constant. Uh, above up to 10, maybe GeV uh, per nucleon, or something like that. And above that, well, we have no data usually, uh, and, uh, uh, but people assume that it's constant, but anyway, it's very, uh, of very little importance for energy loss uh, channels. Huh? So the probability of interacting becomes very small here. So at the end for, say, the carbon flux, it's not a big deal, whatever it's here. Yes. Yes. No, it's the yeah. It's the same. The cro the cross section for the destruction of carbon is also the pro the cross section for the production of boron. Of course, I mean yes. Of course, the point is that at some point this becomes uh, uh, kinematically forbidden. But but the, but the binding energy of a nucleon in the boron is, I don't remember, but should be a couple of MeV. So, so you still can produce, you know, with tens of MeV, you are still a probability to, to, to fragment. Of course, it doesn't mean, if, if your kinetic energy is, whatever, 50 MeV, it doesn't mean that in your uh, momentum exchange will be the whole 50 MeV. But that's why I'm saying this becomes then important to know the binding energy, uh, uh, if there are excite states, uh, you might go to an excite state of carbon, which is unstable and decays into something else. So it's a mess here. Uh, and the fact, and sometimes we have data, sometimes we don't have data. So you have to rely to, on to some uh, uh, nuclear models. And I'm just mentioning this because, in fact, this is one of the main limitations in our capability today to predict the detailed spectral shapes of fluxes like these ones at low rigidity. In this GeV, 10 GeV region, we think it's more or less under control within tens of percent. Huh? But here, sometimes within percent level, if you really have good data. These are the typical uncertainties. And unfortunately, it's not very easy or sexy 
for nuclear physicists to perform this type of measurements, but this is what it, it's something that can be done in the lab, and it's an essential ingredient for cosmic ray studies, uh, but uh, we have to face very often the fact that there is very few data, often they go back to the 70s, uh, you know, it's not very sexy to, to study processes at 100 MeV or GeV, and, and, and there are periodic meetings uh, among theorists and experimentalists uh, uh, trying to identify a few of these cross-sections that are very useful, but be aware in actual codes to, to solve for this, you need thousands of these cross-sections because they are not just elemental cross-section. You want the cross-section isotope by isotope into every possible final state, and that's a huge network. So there is an industry here. Um, okay, I think I can stop here, and then later, maybe 10 minutes, and later we, we are going to discuss uh, some processes which are important for protons when propagating over cosmological distances. Protons and cosmic rays, hadronic cosmic rays, when propagating over cosmological distances. Uh, and their radiation fields are important. And then I will show you maybe a couple of consequences that these processes have uh, coming back to our problem of propagation of cosmic rays. Okay, that's uh, the menu for later. Let's take some break now. So let's resume before, before in, um, offering you what I, I promised. A, 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 a little comment. Of course, uh, eventually, when you have very high energies, one thing that will always be uh, open uh, is, is so, sort of inelastic processes uh, where, for instance, you produce pions uh, or other mesons or hadrons. And typically, yes, this is the regime where things uh, become uh, relevant in that respect. Uh, they are not so important for nuclei. Basically, if you compute the the flux of uh, pions that are produced in inelastic processes like P plus P into P plus P plus pi, zero for instance. These kind of processes, multi-pion production. We will see tomorrow some links between the spectra of these and, uh, and the spectra of the parent proton. Uh, uh, also because these are extremely important in that these pions, for instance, decay into photons which is the main source of hadronically produced uh, gamma rays. Huh? So these are sort of competitors for the inverse Compton photons coming from the electrons. However, a photon doesn't, doesn't come with a, a label that say, hey, my parents were protons, or hey, my parents were electrons. So uh, if you want to know where these photons come from, uh, you have to be a little bit more clever. I will show you tomorrow uh, some of the diagnostics uh, that is used. But in terms of energy loss or in terms of, uh, you know, uh, these processes are not that important, but in practice for protons, because for protons, you, you do not fragment a proton into anything else. You have to conserve the baryon number, right? So uh, uh, a proton will only undergo these loss channels, which are inelastic and can be uh, very large. The, the uh, energy that is transferred to the pion can be, I don't know, 20% or so of the proton energy in a single collision. And also, uh, the other important thing is that this type of processes, in elastic processes, one example is the one I gave you there, uh, the production of antiprotons. This is another inelastic process, hadronic inelastic process. Uh, fortunately, we have a much better understanding of those ones, even from a fundamental point of view, than these ones, although there are still uncertainties. Uh, but, but these are more important, I would say, as source terms. Uh, source for antiprotons, source for pions. Uh, the cross sections for these are smaller than the, these are almost 100 millibarns. These are tens of millibarn, and they, the others are typically uh, one to order of magnitude smaller, two orders of magnitude smaller, something like that. I don't have the numbers in mind, but um, they are more important as source terms than as energy loss terms. Um, concerning um, Extragalactic propagation. So extragalactic propagation uh, is a different story because now the density of matter, I told you that the density of matter in the intergalactic space, at least for low redshift, is typically less than 10 to the minus 6 particles per centimeter cube. And however, you should compare this with the density of the CMB, which is something like 400 particles per centimeter cube. 
right? So you have some nine orders of magnitude difference. And even if cross sections are electromagnetic with photons and are hadronic with, with matter, the, the ones with photons win. Huh? So typically for cosmic rays propagating from faraway galaxies, uh, we really care about the, the I am out of focus, yeah. Uh, the, 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 the interactions with the photons. Actually, for very long time scales, cosmic rays would lose energy even without any interaction, any particle interaction. Just because basically a proton of say 10 to the 18 electron volt, you can look at it like a, 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 a wave. Huh? <laughs> and it has a de Broglie wavelength. And if it's propagating over uh, the expanding universe, its wavelength gets stretched. So they are subject to adiabatic losses ju just due to the universe expansion. So the most, uh, uh, you know, obvious way through which a, 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 a proton or a nucleus, any other particle, uh, can lose energy while propagating over extragalactic uh, distances is just by uh, adiabatic losses. And how much they lose energy is just determined by the Hubble expansion rate. Okay, so explicitly this is H naught times uh, in a modern universe. So at redshift, which is not too high, this is just omega lambda plus one plus Z cube omega matter, where Z is the redshift. Okay. Um, however, there are also microscopic type of interactions. Hmm? One is the so-called beta Eitler. process, and this is for protons, but it exists also for nuclei. Yeah? Proton plus photon into protons plus E plus C minus. Uh, so you have a proton here, you have a, a photon, the CMB photon, uh, and you can have a pair production, basically, from the photon of CMB and the virtual photon from the from the proton, and this is E plus, E minus, this is the proton. Okay, and the same can be mediated from a, from a, a, a nucleus. Now, for the case of the proton, we can use our uh, S uh, conservation to estimate what's the threshold, okay? You can do explicitly, you would find mm, proton square plus twice epsilon times the energy of the proton, one minus cosinus theta. Huh? This must be larger than mass of the proton plus twice of the mass of the electron square. And from these at the threshold, you find the energy of the proton must be larger than basically mass of the proton, mass of the electron over the energy of the background photon. And this is roughly two times 10 to the 18 electron volt. Now, this process, you don't lose much as a low inelasticity in the sense that the amount of energy that is uh, uh, carried away from the, uh, uh, by the electrons, positrons, is a small fraction of the energy of the proton. So this is typically modeled like a continuous energy loss uh, process. It's roughly controlled by the ratio of the mass of the electron over the, uh, of the mass of the, uh, the proton, okay? Um, if you want to have an idea of what's the cross-section, well, again, the scaling is, is sort of um, not so hard to, to guess, right? You have here a, a coupling, you have another vertex here, you have another vertex here, there is the electron propagator, so at the end of the day, you, I hope you won't be surprised if I tell you that beta Heitler cross-section is roughly alpha cube over mass of the electron square, times in principle z square if this is not a proton but a nucleus, and then there is a function that depends on the energy and the z, which is a sort of order one function. Of course you can do it, the, a, a proper quantum field theory calculation. These are things that we can compute because they are QED processes, huh? but just to give you an idea how it scales, and this should be obvious from counting. Um, this is also present for, 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 for nuclei, I told you. Um, and uh, 
However, for nuclei, there is an, a, a process that is perhaps more important than this, especially if you move to higher energies. Okay, so this process, the, the adiabatic energy loss is always present. It just comes from the fact that your particle is freely propagating in an expanding metric. Okay, this one can only happen above some threshold. Uh, uh, what's the typical energy in the frame of the proton of the photon that can trigger this process? Rather obvious, it must be of the order of MeV because you produce a real E plus E minus pair. So we are talking about energies at which the proton sees a photon of the CMB as energetic as an MeV or Halger photon, and this can produce a pair. If photons of, uh, uh, of the CMB at these ultra energies are seen at the MeV level, what else can happen to a nucleus, for instance? Well, the photon can f uh, 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 knock out some nucleons from the, uh, from the nucleus because we are again talking about MeV type of energies. So one process that happens through which nuclei propagating over extragalactic distances uh, lose energy is uh, a photo, uh, photo destruction, photo dissociation. Okay, so you have a process, can I erase that one? let's write schematically as A plus gamma. Usually, again, I hope it's clear, this gamma is usually the CMB photons. Huh? You can compute the same thing on the extragalactic background light, and you will get that the threshold as a factor 1,000 lower, but the mean free path will be a 1,000 times longer. Huh? That's loosely the, or a few hundred times longer. So this goes into A minus one, maybe, plus gamma. Well, that we don't care about that anymore. <laughs> Plus, plus a nucleon. Huh? This is the pro plus whatever, but this is the process through which you lose energy, huh? and you also change the nature of your, of your, um, uh, of your um, nucleus. Of course, now this process, the exact details depend on the nucleus you are looking at, and you can expect that the threshold will be higher for nuclei which are more tightly bound. So where this threshold happens to be, typically between 10 to the few times 10 to the 18 and uh, 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 10 to the 20 electron volt. What's the hardest nucleus to break? Iron. Huh? So this process, in fact, for iron uh, is going, or iron group nuclei, is going to happen at energies above, uh, about 10 to 20 electron volt or so, even above some, if I'm not wrong. Um, so somehow, how important this is at a given energy depends on which species you're looking at. Uh, there is another process which is extremely important, perhaps the most important process for uh, ultra-energy cosmic rays, and this is, uh, this is just the, 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 the photopion production. So a proton impinging on the CMB photons, if this is energetic enough, can give rise to things like pi zero plus proton or pi plus plus neutron, or you can also have multi-pion production. Okay, this process, um, okay, let's first write down the, the energy at which the, the, this, this is about threshold. Now we know how to compute it. Get the energy of the proton larger than twice MP, ME plus M pi square over uh, energy of the background photon, which is 4 times 10 to the 19 electron volt. Okay. Uh, this process is historically important. Um, it was predicted to happen just, uh, I think, very soon after the discovery of the CMB. Uh, it's known as greisen zatsepin uh, kuzmin uh, process and it has a cross section which is unusually large for uh, photon mediated, electromagnetic mediated type of processes. Why? In particular, one reason, but not the only one, <laughs> is the fact that uh, it goes through a it goes through a resonance, and then this is roughly the cross section versus 
the cross sections versus energy. This value of energy for the resonance corresponds to exciting the delta plus uh, adron resonance, the spin uh, three half resonance you might have heard about in nuclear and particle physics introduction. And to give you an idea, uh, this high energy plateau is at the level of 0.1 millibar, and this peak is at the level of uh, 0.6 millibar, which are rather large values for cross sections which are uh, mediated by electromagnetism. Okay, um, and uh, one can compute the 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 mean free path on the CMB associated to this. By the way, in this process, they lose quite a bit of energy. Something like 20 percentage of their energies is going into into these uh, pions, which eventually decay. Um, the mean free path associated to that is at the level of tens of megaparsec, 10 megaparsec or so, which is a very short distance over cosmological scale. Okay, so one of the consequences, so compared to this, uh, although this is frequent enough, the energy lost per interaction is very small. So before you lose a significant amount of energy, basically here, you have to go through gigaparsec. For this guy, and to some extent also for this type of process, a little bit less, but also there, uh, after uh, maybe 10 or few tens of megaparsec, you have lost maybe half of your energy. Okay, and we are talking about a very steep spectrum. So if you move your energy by a factor two, means it disappears from, from observation, right? So the consequence of the existence of this process is that the flux of ultra energy cosmic rays should drop exponentially, basically, above roughly these energies. The same process can happen also for nuclei, of course. It's just there is a factor uh, uh, Z difference. I mean, you, you have to account for the fact that you need actually A. There is a, 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 it's the energy per nucleon that determines the, it's the same energy per nucleon, roughly. Huh? So before it becomes important for nuclei, you have to go to very high energies, unless the nucleus is, I don't know, helium. Huh? Uh, for nuclei, these guys kill you much faster much faster I mean, in energy space before, before you, you get rid of it. So this, this expected cutoff in the flux of cosmic rays, so if you look at the flux of cosmic rays versus energy, whatever it is, you would expect that it's a power law like, but we expect that instead of continuing forever, there should be some sort of exponential cutoff at an energy which is determined by these, if these are protons, and maybe a slightly different value if these are nuclei determined by the details of that process. Mm? The, uh, the, the, the one associated to protons is called uh, uh, Gleisen, Zetsepin, uh, Kuzmin cutoff. Uh? And uh, again, this is another instance where if you observe particles with energies much higher than this threshold, something interesting might going on. Okay. Uh, and uh, in fact, there was an experiment <laughs> roughly 20 years ago that claimed that that's what I had seen. Uh, Agaza uh, is the name of this experiment. And uh, uh, at that point, you had to basically two, op two options. Either the cosmic rays must come from nearby, or they are exotic. There is some exotic physics going on. Now, the point of getting them from nearby is that at these energies, there was an exercise suggested, at these energies, the deflections in typical magnetic fields is not that large. So within our galaxy, these cosmic rays should be roughly ballistic. They get deflected, but not by a lot. And they saw a quasi-isotropic sky. So if it's coming from our galaxy, you should imagine things like coming from the halo of our galaxy, not the disk. And this is one prediction that you get in dark matter type of decay models. So one possibility is that these guys are, are emitted by decaying of very heavy dark matter. Another possibility, for instance, is that Lorentz uh, uh, invariance is violated. You have a huge boost here that enters. So maybe, you know, the, uh, uh, when, when, the, when the Lorentz factors are very, very large, 
the Lorentz invariance is not valid anymore, and you must have corrections. And people had some theories, phenomenological theories inspired by some ideas in quantum gravity, why this should happen, or could happen, rather. So at that time, there was lots of excitement. But remember, these experiments, Agasa was one of them, was one of the indirect type of experiments where they have to estimate things like the energy of the particles very indirectly, even well above the energies explored at colliders. At the time, we didn't even have LHC. So really estimating the energies of these particles and thus the flux as a function of energy is very, very tough. And the most commonly accepted explanation today for what they saw especially since this has not been confirmed by Telescope Array and, and Auger, is that this was a calibration issue. They did their best. It's not like they were bad. But, you know, there are intrinsic difficulties in running these experiments, and I try to emphasize them already in the first lecture. Uh, but, again, these are examples. Still searches for these type of processes go on. Okay? There are other ways through which you can test things like dark matter origin at, of cosmic ray fluxes at very high energies, which is through composition. Astrophysical sources are giving us protons, nuclei. We know that photons, they cannot get to us, right? Because the extragalactic space is opaque above uh, some energy. However, if you have dark matter, very heavy dark matter, we are talking about, you know, billions of uh, GV or TV, but who knows. Uh, uh, if it decays, well, it typically it decays not only in hadrons, but also into photons and neutrinos and so on. So one signature, and they come from the hull of our galaxy. So they can survive. Their mean free path is comparable or much longer than that, right? So at the end, you, another way to look for exotic physics here is not to look for spectral feature, but to look for chemical feature. So you have a flux which is rich in neutral particles, neutrinos and photons. Uh, and this is another way to look for new physics, typically. How do you detect if a particle is a proton of a nucleus at 10 to the 18, 19, 20 electron volt? Well, it's hard. But there are techniques. Uh, neutrinos are very penetrating particles. So typically, they interact much deeper in the atmosphere and you might want to look at very inclined shower, almost close to the horizon, because there you have filtered out everything that interacts a lot. This is one way. Hmm? Or you might look at characteristic of the showers. Photon showers are much more muon pure, uh, sorry, poor than uh, adronic shower. So the muon content of a shower can tell you if this looks electromagnetic or adronic. Now you start connecting with what I told you in the first lecture. So these are things that can be used to do new physics searches. Um, I think I will stop here for the type of processes that we care about. And uh, let me just, uh, in the final 15 minutes or so, show you some consequences of this type of processes, continuous energy losses, catastrophic energy losses, uh, uh, have on our, on our um, diffusion loss uh, type of equation. So I already showed you how the, the term for, for continuous energy losses look like. Huh? Now let's see what are the consequences of this term on the spectrum of your cosmic rays. So remember what I argued was that in our transport uh, blah blah blah, equal, we have to add something which is basically 1 over p square derivative with respect to p, p square dp over dt uh, loss times phi. Of course, you might have a, a, a source term. Uh, and then you have uh, some minus gamma phi. And then you have all the plus sum of, uh, you know, beta into whatever of gamma betas times uh, phi betas. Okay, so let's forget about this catastrophic type of terms, injection and, and, and depletion. Uh, let's assume, and you can do this exercise, but let's assume that we have some energy loss process, continuous one, and you have all these propagation processes, diffusion time scale, advection time scale, etc. 
So what's my suggestion? My suggestion is that for each of these terms, you compute the typical time scale associated to each of these terms and look at what is the fastest one, what is the shortest time scale for the processes at end. There are cases, one practical case is the case of leptons, electrons and positrons, where this guy can be actually shorter in time scales than the diffusion, advection, etc., etc., etc. So a first order solution to our complicated equation in this case is just to get rid of this left hand side because anyway this is the leading term. Okay? If you do so, you can solve for phi just with a source term and this one. And what you get uh, is just minus one over p square uh, derivative with respect to p p square dp over dt phi equal to a q of p. Okay? So, of course, if this is really leading, everything will be local. So the spatial transport is irrelevant. So basically, this is also going to determine the, the, the space dependence. Huh? This guy also depends on space because, for instance, the target density depends on space. But let's forget about this complication. Let's assume that we are in a small region. Everything is homogeneous within. So you can, you can solve for this. Huh? And you get that the flux of P will be given by something like uh, uh, 1 over P square minus dP over dt, which is a positive thing. And then you have the integral dP prime of Q P prime P square, P prime square. So let's imagine that this dP over dt is if dp over dt is proportional to, to some p to the power l, huh? and let's imagine that q is proportional to some uh, p to the power, uh, let's use actually minus indices so that, yeah, yeah. Okay, minus s. Why I do so? Because yesterday I convinced you that some acceleration mechanism at least can produce power law type of uh, spectra, okay? So I, I, I'm keeping an agnostic here, so S is a free parameter. What do I expect by integrating here? I expect that my phi of P will be proportional to P to the minus L minus L minus S plus one. Hmm? So let's rephrase this. In terms of the, the ratio between the solution phi of p and the source term q of p. Well, just a quick question. Yes. Yeah, yeah, this is the steady state solution. And, okay, usually in cosmic rays, that's what you do for, for two reasons. Well, the main reason is that we don't have, uh, we never measure cosmic rays over a long time scale compared to all the time scales present. So I we don't know how much a cosmic rays fluctuate in time. Yes and no, I, I have a caveat on that. A and the, re the second reason is that uh, even if sources are not st uh, uh, steady state, huh? and we don't think they are steady state, supernova explode and, and, and fade away, and these time scales are, you know, hundreds of millions, uh, hundreds of thousands of years, which are short on astrophysical time scale. Huh? However, we, we can only compute some sort of ensemble average. And we are under the approximation that the ensemble average is time independent. It doesn't mean, that's the problem I raised, it doesn't mean that the flux you observe at any given time is coinciding with your ensemble average. Huh? So there are many, many sub subtleties like that. Concerning the time, the time fluctuation that you can observe, we can infer some, uh, something on cosmic ray as a function of time over long time scales but only at low energies, 
uh, where the bulk of cosmic rays happen. And this is happening um, because of, uh, for instance, in em environmental sciences. There are things, or uh, archaeology sometimes is interested by that, like uh, carbon-14. Carbon-14 depends on the, on the rate of cosmic rays impinging on the atmosphere. That's how you form uh, 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 this, the, the, this isotope. And this may depend on, on things even including the sun uh, magnetic field or the fluxes of cosmic rays. Um, or sometimes we have access to uh, some layers in the deep oceans. Uh, I'm not an expert on a geologist, but there are cases where you can uh, infer uh, indirectly uh, variations of the rate of production of these secondaries or tracers of cosmic rays. Uh, but even dendrochronology uh, can help in these things. Uh, how fast uh, uh, trees grow uh, uh, over time uh, can correlate with climate, and climate can correlate with the, the, um, the, the, the thickness of the atmosphere. So when you do these studies, you have to make sure that you control the assumption on the probability of forming these secondaries, and they can vary either because the climate varies or because, I don't know, maybe a few million years ago, a supernova explode not far away. And there are indications of this sort of events. So modulo this type of archaeological evidence, uh, we cannot have access to variations of cosmic ray fluxes over time scales, which are significant. Okay? Uh, anyway. This ratio is going to be uh, given by what? It's basically going to be a constant when L is equal to 1. Huh? What's an example of L equal to 1? Bremsstrahlung. It's going to be plus 1 in P when L is equal to 0. This is the case of ionization. And it's going to be steeper by one power when L is going to be uh, 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 the, the, the two for inverse Compton and synchrotron losses. And I told you that these things dominate at different energies. So if I, flux, if, if I make the ratio of the, if I look at the flux of electrons under the approximation that, you know, energy losses are the dominant effect, which is okay, but not really precise from the quantitative point of view, I should expect that the flux of electrons times some power, like, I don't know, two, two point whatever, sh should look like this. And these points should tell me when the ionization losses bad block type of thing dominates, when Bremsstrahlung dominates, when these radiative type of processes dominate. This is an oversimplification, but this tells you how you can use fluxes uh, and, and energy dependence to do diagnostics on these particle processes. Hmm? Um, final words on the catastrophic loss uh, type of uh, processes. Uh, there it's easy, in a sense. Huh? You just modify your source term with a sink term or with a sort of secondary source term, which is the last piece there. So one thing you can do is to consider, again, the problem that you consider in the past of predicting what's the flux of secondaries, like lithium, beryllium, boron, starting from a purely primary flux of, say, carbon, oxygen. Okay? So in that case, what do you have? For carbon, you will have just, in this approximation, the source of carbon, or CNO, rather, and then we, we, we forget about iron and every nucleus, so for carbon and blah, 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 you just get some gamma primary times flux of CNO. This is the loss rate due to spallation. For secondaries, this term is not there. Lithium, beryllium, boron, this is zero. But they will have some loss term of secondaries times the flux of secondaries, plus a gamma of primary into secondaries times the flux of primary. So this is what acts as source term for them. Now, you can solve in the pure diffusive case, forget about all the other terms, 
just what you did in the first section of the exercise, you can solve now the coupled system of primaries and secondaries under the same approximation. Hmm? And you will find a result. This afternoon, you may, you may look for details with, with, with Sylvia, that the flux of secondaries over the flux of primaries is going to be written as the gamma of primaries into secondaries times an effective time scale. Huh? And this effective time scale, you can also write as gamma primary into secondaries in some limits that you will describe as the thickness of the, of the diffusive halo times the small thickness of the disk over the diffusion coefficient, which in general depends on p. Hmm? Remember that when you studied the, 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 the simple problem of uh, diffusion, you were finding that the flux would look like the source term times an effective time scale, which depends, diffusive time scale, that depends on momentum. So if you just look at the proton flux or the carbon flux, there is no way you know what belongs to what. <laughs> you just have a product. If you do that, you can factorize out this thing. So that's one way astrophysicists try to determine, because the other term is nuclear physics. This is stuff you can measure in the lab. Hmm? So this is one way we learn about the average diffusion properties of the medium. Okay? So it's important that, and by the way, this is the more correct way to deal with the problem that you saw of the Gramage crossed by uh, cosmic rays, blah, blah, blah. Now you have the correct equation, huh? and you can look at what happens, and you get the same result in the plane. Huh? You, you get the same result that this naive uh, phenomenological modeling would give you. Um, there is another application that you can do very easily with the tools that you have learned, and it's a proxy for the, the, the studies that you do uh, searching for dark matter in cosmic rays. Okay, so what changes in the case of dark matter and cosmic rays? Okay, first of all, for antiproton production, for instance, let's consider the antiproton channel to be defined. Uh, this sort of writing may be symbolic in the sense that the true thing is sort of an integral, it's a convolution of a differential rate or differential cross section times the parent flux. Huh? So you should see this product like a convolution product. This is a technical complication. It's not very important. But imagine that now antiprotons are only produced through the inelastic processes affecting protons in their propagation. Through this type of argument, huh, I know the proton flux. I know the propagation effective time scale from boron over carbon analysis. So in principle, I should be able to predict, to predict what is the antiproton production associated to cosmic ray propagation? That's what people do. In ANSI, for instance, we do. If you measure a flux and you get an agreement or not with this, with this prediction, if you get an agreement, of course, you validate your understanding. But it might be that there is a difference in the spectrum that is consistent with the spectrum of antiprotons that you expect from a production of, anti, uh, of dark matter annihilation into the halo of our galaxy. So this is one way that, in principle, gives you access to extra channels of production of antiprotons. Where is the trick? The problem is that the, an the antiprotons that are produced in our galaxy from putative dark matter sources come from the halo. The first problem is that we don't know what dark matter is. So for each model of dark matter, you should compute this putative flux. Huh? So there is a mod intrinsic particle physics dependence. But fine, we know the, the rules of the game. But there is a more subtle problem. The more subtle problem is that the distribution of these sources, dark matter annihilation, is now in the thick halo of our galaxy. Hmm? And if you go and solve the diffusion problem, with this type of geometry, and I give you a toy model with a proxy for that, it's not exact, but just to illustrate the, the difficulty, you end up with the conclusion that the flux of antiprotons from dark matter depend on extra parameters of astrophysical nature, not the same parameters that you have determined with these studies. So 
in doing this game, somehow we have to be clever and try to measure things which are very hard to measure. New physics signals are not only dependent on new physics parameters, but also dependent on new astrophysical parameters. In more realistic setting, they depend on astrophysical parameters in a different way than the ordinary astrophysical fluxes. So this is one of the major limitations in pushing the sensitivity of these searches very much. You might have degeneracies between, say, the cross-section for annihilation of dark matter and the size of the magnetic diffusive halo of the galaxy. So the, 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 the challenge is how can we tackle this problem? How can we measure this parameter and, and thus uh, constrain the other? And you can try to do this, for instance, with radioactive isotopes that act as clocks. But that's much more challenging for an experiment to measure uh, radioactive uh, uh, isotopic type of uh, cosmic rays. Huh? Because you have to measure both the charge and the mass. The charge of the nucleus won't be enough. So this is uh, just to give you uh, um, the, 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 the flavor, the taste, for the, for the difficulties and, and interesting application that you can do uh, with these type of models. So let me conclude this lecture with just some uh, limitations of the theory that I presented. It looks like we have all the ingredients to do, to do the, the, the cosmic ray astrophysics, and that's more or less the ingredients that you would find in codes like Galprop or Dragon or semi-analytical codes like Cuisine. Okay? What you should know is what is not inside these codes. What I have used here is an approximation. Of course, one thing is that we have used the scattering centers moving non-relativistically, which is perfectly fine in our galaxy, but it would not be fine in, in uh, some extragalactic objects like gamma ray burst and in general relativistic type of acceleration. Okay, but there is a more fundamental limitation. I have used the cosmic rays propagating on an externally given configuration of magnetic fields. Static, moving, whatever. But these are God-given type of uh, uh, fields. Cosmic rays are moving charged particles. They are associated to a current. What does a current do, uh, do in a Maxwell equation? It generates fields, magnetic fields. So cosmic rays themselves will affect the fields, the medium onto which they propagate, and also on the medium onto which they get accelerated. So in truth, this problem is deeply nonlinear. Okay? These type of feedback effects, either in the acceleration or in the propagation, are not included in the codes. Huh? So be aware that you are missing a huge piece of physics. So it's an ansatz that this is not relevant for some of these things. Now many groups are starting to study these things, among which uh, our group. Uh, but, uh, and it's much harder numerically. So usually you try to gain some insight from uh, toy model studies. Huh? It can even be that some of the features in the spectral cosmic rays are due to the fact that it's, they, they couple to the fluctuations that they generate themselves. Huh? So this is more or less the frontier, both in, astro in acceleration and in propagation of the current studies. And I'll stop here and tomorrow we do some more multi-messenger uh, type of links with some implications, okay? Thank you.